Hi, beautiful ones. My intention with the Shamanjelic Healing Podcast is to be a platform that explores real life issues and provides you with valuable insights and practical tools to support you on your journey of healing core wounds and reclaiming your power and manifesting a thriving, impactful life that you absolutely love. You see, it's my dream to inspire millions to shine. So if you find these topics valuable, please take a moment and share the podcast and leave us a rave review. This helps the podcast grow and reach the people that would greatly benefit from these insights. Thank you so much for tuning in and investing in your personal development. I'm right here walking this journey with you. So let's dive into this episode. Welcome everybody to the Shamanjelic Healing Podcast, a delicious experience you are in for today. We are going to dive into healing inner child wounds and this whole reparenting thing and what that's all about. And uh, I'm so excited to have Christine Hassler with us today, who is uh, a three-time author one of, and a best-selling author. One of her, my favorite books is Expectation Hangover. So you got to go check that out. I think it's a phenomenal book. She is has a master's in spiritual psychology. She also has a fantastic internationally acclaimed podcast over it and on with it. So be sure to check that out. She's a coach and a speaker and really a, a leader in this field of personal development. Couldn't imagine another person more qualified and soulful and honest and authentic, real and genuine. And, you know, a truth teller, which I appreciate in this field. So before before we dive in, I want to just make sure that all the listeners and viewers go to the show notes where you can get access to Christine's website and to her social media and also her podcast. And I have a free gift for listeners today, and that is a guided meditation that takes you into that place of the inner child to do some inner child healing and announcing that we are doing Again, the Sacred Feminine, Awakening the Sacred Feminine online uh, series, which is a deep dive into the womb. This is for women only, and that is a virtual series that goes from conception all the way to present day to kind of unravel the imprints so that we can remember who we are. So check that out. The link will also be in the show notes um, for the for the details on that delicious experience. So Christine, my beautiful sister, so grateful as always to connect. There's this kindred, like authentic yumminess uh, when when we connect. Oh, yeah. And um, so grateful to have you on the show today. And so, can you share with us a little about like this whole inner child thing? Like, what are symptoms? of when the inner child has experienced wounding or neglect or a trauma that is hasn't been healed what does that look like yeah. you know in adult life well i'll back up just for a second and let's define what an inner child is yeah. now so that people have a context for it so the inner child is not some woo-woo term that people in personal development thought would be cool to to, to call something. <laughs> it's an actual psychological reality. And so, so much of our, our behavior is driven by the inner child. So only about five to seven percent of our behavior is driven by our conscious thought. Mm. So most of our reactions, thoughts, behavior, feelings, are driven by the subconscious programming that mostly comes from our past. So people probably know that the way you are as an adult was dramatically shaped by your childhood, not defined because as adults, we have free will and we can become our own parents and we can reshape who we are. However, as children, we don't have that autonomy. We don't have that knowledge. We can't say at five years old, um, that is violating my boundary and you cannot speak to me like that. We can't get <laughs> ourselves out of an abusive home like we can get out of an abusive relationship as an adult. And so the things that happen to us as, as children, we don't have as much control over. I personally think they're all part of 
our soul curriculum and our soul lessons, what we're here to learn, but they're pretty crappy to go through at times. You know, being a kid is not always easy. And I haven't talked to many people who say, oh gosh, I had a totally fabulous childhood, like no issues whatsoever. If you're one of those people, that's awesome. God bless you. And please raise more children like you. (laughs) Most of us usually have some wounding. And so the inner child is the part of us that exists throughout our entire life. It never goes away. It's not a specific age. It's not like three or five or 10. It's basically everything in our subconscious that before the age of 12, 15 ish. And so it can be any age, but it's that part of us that's very, very tender, very sensitive, very needy. And being needy as a child is, is correct. Like that's, that's something that, you know, as children, we, we have needs and it's our parents' responsibility to meet those needs. Again, as we become adults, we become more responsible for meeting our needs and asking for needs. But again, as children, we are needy and we adults are supposed to meet those needs. It doesn't always happen. So it's that sensitive, tender, needy, innocent, very programmable part of us. It also is incredibly creative, incredibly intuitive, very connected to spirit, very confident because that that pure inner child, that unwounded inner child doesn't have self-judgment. So it's that it's it's actually full of self-love in a really beautiful way. And if I didn't already say this, it's very, very wise. So the purpose of inner child work is one, to not have the same expectation hangovers, disappointments, um, triggers come up as adults. That's that's one of the, the points of it. But the other really beautiful part of doing inner child work is we start to get more connected again to our deep sensitivity and our creativity and our playfulness and our wisdom and our self-love. Because when we connect to that inner child, it's it's very, I mean, if everybody can just picture like a three-year-old right now and or a baby and like imagine being mad at them or judging them or saying, you suck, you're not good enough. Like, no, you just feel so much love. And so when we connect to that inner child, we start to feel more of that. So, yeah. Okay, do you want to, I'm just going to go no, to no, I, I think I, I, I appreciate that you're, you, you're, you're starting here of just understanding how wise they are and uninhibited and adventurous. And, you know, when I do regressions with my clients and we go back to that innocence, intuition, playfulness, adventure and, and wisdom, there is so much there before the fill in the blank. Before the imprints, judgments, uh, you know, projections, traumas, whatever, like imprinting, there is this, there is this seed of potential truth um, and authenticity that I think when we're doing this, we're peeling back the layers to remember that again. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And so it, it's not that the inner child has al- always been been traumatized when we can, depending on what age we're going back to, right? Yeah. What I hear you saying is that there's times where we can connect to that part of our inner child that is alive and vital and, and wise and playful and adventurous. It doesn't have a lot of fears. Yeah, exactly. When we do the inner child wounding work, when we do the healing then even if you had trauma at let's say eight years old you go back you do that healing and you can free that eight-year-old and so it's like any part of you can be free of trauma because again the mind doesn't know the difference between a very well imagined thought or a very like the regressions you do when we go back and we heal those memories and actual reality so that's a beautiful thing about healing is that we can go back and actually change our relationship to our past and heal those issues so we don't have to become victims of what happened to us. Like our childhood doesn't have to be the reason we don't have what we want in our life. It can be something that provides the most beautiful beautiful lessons for us and informs what is really important to us in life. And I've been amazed at, you know, when people really go back and connect with that inner child and heal memories. And P.S., you don't have to have crystal clear memories, really any memories of your childhood. 
people to do inner child healing. And we'll talk about that when we get to actually do it. Um, but it, it's just, it's, it's beautiful, the changes that I see in someone's current day reality. And so to, to circle back to your question about what are some kind of signatures of inner child wounding? Well, basically anything that's not going the way you want it to in your life, any emotional addictions you have, any sabotaging patterns, bad habits, um, obstacles you keep facing, it usually results to inner child wounding, anxiety, depression, um, addictions, all of those come from an unmet need of the inner child. So the, the inner, just like a child, when its needs aren't being met, will act out to get attention. So children will at first try, they'll try to get their needs met. And when their needs aren't met, they'll either totally regress and internalize and totally withdraw, or they will act out. And that's what's happening to us as adults. We either completely repress, regress, and kind of wither away and isolate and go inward into shame and isolation, or we act out either sometimes at others, but most likely in ways like sabotaging, addictions, um, th those kinds of things. And so when we go back and do the work with the inner child, it's like we don't, we don't run into those kinds of issues anymore. So if you're having any kind of the same like I like to say, expectation hangover, things not going according to plan or the same kind of curveballs going at you or things going according to your plan, but you don't feel like you thought you would. You get that great job or you're finally in that relationship and it doesn't ease the pain of your own insecurity or self-doubt or not enoughness. So those kind of expectation hangovers are the way the inner child is crying out for help. And it's like, stop trying to put a Band-Aid on things. Stop trying trying to solve, meet my needs through external things and actually listen to me, please listen to me. And whenever I am triggered or have anxiety or something is just off, I always go in and check in with little Christine. And I ask her, I ask myself, what is this reminding you of? So often we ask ourselves, why am I doing this? Why am I happening? And then we go to, how do I change it? Those are dead end questions. Instead, that question, what does this remind me of? How, when have I felt like this before? And you ride that back in time as far as you can to find the origin of when those feelings and those belief systems started. And that's really where the goal is in terms of healing. And I think why so many people get frustrated with personal development, because they're trying to solve a current present day problem. But that problem is the result of something that happened way back in the past. And so unless you go back here you're just going to feel like you're looping and backtracking the whole time and this, and this sounds, and this like, sounds like, yeah, really appreciate that this is how you're looping this is that this is why patterns keep repeating or i can't break this addiction to sugar or alcohol or codependent relationships or um this keeps happening to me this keeps happening to me um and it, it the I, I love the, the this the question loop is a dead end of why am i doing this versus what is what is familiar about this? What is this really about? And going back to the seed of what the issue is, the void, it feels like there's this big void, whether it's like, I need to be acknowledged, I, I need love, I need um, to feel safe, all of these unmet needs, the void that was created by whatever experience, even if people had a great childhood, that doesn't mean every need was met which isn't bashing parents. It's just acknowledging that there was a gap in whatever way between what was needed and what was provided. And that isn't being a whiner or a complainer to go back and look at, okay, there was a gap there. Right. Whether it was a safety gap, a love gap, uh, I didn't, I, I didn't, uh, I wasn't having the guidance that I needed uh, or stability whatever the gap was between what was needed and, and what was provided is, is, is where those adult pattern, we can look in the, in that gap for where the adult patterns are repeating. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. I'll give, I'll give an example. This was a woman I just coached on my podcast and um, I think examples really help land yeah. these things. So she called in cause on my podcast, I coach people unscripted and edited and unproduced. They just, we get on the phone and we just go, and she, she um, is a yoga teacher and wants to get into coaching. And she 
said, I'm having trouble fully owning it. I'm still seeing it as a side hustle. I am afraid to step into it fully, but it's what I really, really want to do. And I said, well, what do you think is holding you back? And she actually, I think I might've said, what do you think you're protecting yourself from? Because whenever Mm -hmm. we are in a sabotaging or limiting behavior, I like to coach people to call those a protective behavior because Mm -hmm. we really don't sabotage ourselves. We, We really don't. Um, that's a, that's a, it's a nasty word to use with ourselves. And it just reinforces the inner judgment and feeling like we're failing. Cause why would anyone sabotage what they truly want? What we're really doing when we think we're sabotaging ourselves is we're protecting ourselves. Mm-hmm. So what we got to in the discussion is she was protecting herself from unmet expectations for owning it and stepping into it. And then it not turning out like she planned having an expectation hangover and people judging her and feeling like she failed. And so we unpacked that a little more. And I said, this feeling of disappointment and this feeling like you're not living up to expectations. Has this been around for a while? Yes. Was it there in childhood? Yes. Tell me about that. All right. Well, I always really wanted people to validate my intelligence and my hard work. I worked so hard in school and my parents never said they were proud of me. I'd come home with an A or an award and they'd just sort of be indifferent. And I just, I just wanted them to feel proud of me. I wanted to feel validated. And I said to her, that need to feel like someone's proud of you, especially your parents, is a very healthy need. Sometimes as adults, I think that we get so hard on ourselves and think that we're needy and think that we shouldn't have these things affect us. But I just reinforced for her, Every child needs to feel like their parents are proud of them. That's a psychological need. It's a developmental need that children have. And yours was not met. So what you're, what happens, like with any of us, is we try to meet that need as adults. So she keeps chasing external things to get that validation, but yet is scared to pursue them because she doesn't want to fail and be hard on herself. And feel like she's she's disappointing herself because she always felt like her parents were disappointed in her. Mm -hmm. So the work we did was going back and talking. I can use her name because she's on the podcast, so it's a public thing. We went and talked to little Trevi and had her connect with that inner child, took her back through a process, had her connect and just start telling her, I'm so proud of you. You're doing so amazing. You're such an incredible girl. Like I see you. And I said, okay, those are great words, but let's bring the feeling too. Because a lot of times what we do is we say the right words, we do the affirmations, we mentally go through the process, but it doesn't drop below our neck. The inner child speaks through the body and through feeling. So if you're just trying to get your inner child through your head, it's, it's gonna, you're not going to quite get there. So you really want to get to the feeling. And so she got to that feeling feeling proud and connecting with that little one and saying, I'm so proud of you. You're doing so awesome. And feeling that. And then I asked her, how do you feel about your business? And she goes, oh my gosh, excited, hopeful, yeah. capable, everything. And I said, that's, that's it. That's your come from. Because you were, you were quote unquote sabotaging yourself, but really protecting yourself because that inner child was holding you back. She was saying, I can't do this until I feel like someone's proud of me. I don't feel like I'm enough to pursue this until I feel validated. And as Trevi does that inner work with that little girl, and I put her on a 40 day process where she's dropping in, she's connecting the little Trevi. She's telling her she's proud of her, not just for what she does, but for who she is. And she's connecting to that feeling of being seen and being validated. Like, Oh, I matter. I have someone's approval, which again is a need for the inner child. And then we fulfill that need for our own inner child rather than looking for it from other people. And so as she begins to do that, I feel, and I'm excited to see how it turns out, that the career will, that that will take care of itself. You know, I could give her career coaching, but then that would make her feel worse because then she'd have all these tips for how to build a career as a coach and she'd still be running into the brick wall Mm -hmm. because again, that inner child prevents us from moving forward until we meet its needs. This is exact. I love the this example because it's a you know a real life example of a gap 
between I did, did not get external about validation and a process of the inner child healing. Let's go to that. And this is for everybody watching and listening. And I love this example. What I do with my clients as well is like, let's go to that version of you. And what did you need to hear? And I love that. Like what, what did you need to feel and making it visceral, like hug that, hug that inner child, hug that little boy, that little girl, grab their hand, play with them, let them cry on your shoulder and, and, and like give them that feeling, that emotion, like you said, or validation, pride, acknowledgement, or a hug, or um, it's going to be okay. Like it's not where it's not your fault and, and to have a visceral emotion and even a physical experience with it, it is, I appreciate that you said, Hey, we can, we can be all up in the head and just have a mantra that says you're okay. You're safe. Right. You know, your way to go. And the emotion is flat and it's really just from here up. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for bringing that um, awareness to bring it down into the emotion and, viscerally, emotionally, energetically connect to that part, be that person that, you know, that they needed at that time, yeah. whether it was a role model or a protector or a cheerleader, yeah. <laughs> you know, because this is where the gap is, is and, and you're, what, what you're explaining is that reparenting of saying, okay, well, what I didn't get, now I get to bring that to myself. Absolutely. As an adult, I get to fill in the gaps and 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 I love this, you know, make it this role and do it every day so that you it you has get, to be because because yeah. the wounding happened because of a feeling. Not yes. because of a thought. You know, she didn't wake up one day and say, hmm, don't think I've been particularly validated. She felt <laughs> the disappointment, she felt the rejection, she felt the lack, and that that hurt her. And that's that's why it lodges in because as as children, things that things that hurt us scare us or shame us are the things that stick. And well, let's talk about this piece around yeah. hurt because that is an experience where the hurt came from a, of not validating um, achievements when the, the hurt is more physical, um, physical abuse or emotional. Uh, not only are you not, not getting validation, but, but it's not uncommon for, you know, what I experienced in my clients where they were exposed to, you're not good enough. You're never going to amount to anything where uh, it wasn't neutral and you get nothing, but it was you know worse, yeah. whether it was verbal, yeah. um, which has, a, and then also has emotion behind it or actually, uh, and we'll get into a set. Let's, let's just do that first. And then we'll get into where there's, when there's been a physical boundary, um crossed and how we do the inner child work there so what if it's just what if it's verbal or emotional distress mm -hmm. that isn't so neutral yeah yeah well it's 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 the same thing but even more love is required yeah <laughs> so, tenderness. you know it's going back i think a big thing when it's that that verbal of being told that you're something you're not enough or whatever of course, that's going to create hurt and that's going to create a lot of shame, too, and a lot of self-doubt. And so it's, again, going back to that little one. And the, the, the mistake I see a lot of people make in inner child work is they go back and they try to explain. They try to explain to the child and say, mom only told you that you weren't enough or you'd never amount to anything because she had a mom who told her that and she wasn't fulfilled in her life. And so it wasn't about you and you're going to grow up and you're going to have a nice husband. No, no, that does not work for the inner child explanation. Big no for the inner child, because again, that inner child, when you go back and explain, it feels minimized. Right. It's sort of like, doesn't understand. Anyway, yeah, if, if, you know, something just happened to me and Anta and, and, I, I was just in like a really big disappointment. And you said, well, five years from now, Christine, you're going to forget about it. I would feel completely that's invalidated. Bypassing. Yeah. That's bypassing. That's like your feelings don't matter. It's a, it's another, it's another assault. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So when we go back, we don't want to explain. We want to go back to that little one and first say, I'm here. I'm listening. 
Mm -hmm. What do you have to say? Because especially when there's a lot of verbal abuse or verbal programming, that inner child loses connection with how they feel and their own thoughts because so much programming about who they are is going in. Yeah, they lose their voice. So you want to go back and say, I'm here. And sometimes, and we'll, we can kind of break down for people how you connect to inner child. Because some people are like, I have no idea how to do it. Is there a phone number? Is there an 800 yeah. number? Yeah. <laughs> get there. Everybody's good there. I mean, we teach an inner child workshop and people that were like, so resistant, but they never have memories, can't connect to the inner child, think it's like some, you know, woo woo spiritual development thing, have profound experiences because that inner child is in all of us and it's so ready. It so wants you to come and get him or her. So when you go back and you just say, hi, little Christine, I am here. I'm here. here and I'm this Is there anything you'd like to say? So before we get into the reassurance, which is that you didn't do anything wrong, it wasn't your fault. You're, you're amazing and perfect just the way you are. That reassuring, compassionate, compassionate. We've got that motherly energy that's reassuring and nurturing. We've got that fatherly energy that's holding the space and saying, no matter how big your feelings or thoughts, I'm here, I've got you. That's the inner, the inner parents, both the mother and the father, like coming together and nurturing that inner child. So before we get to, to that, we just want to just let that little one speak. What do you have to say? What are you feeling? What do you thinking and then we go from there i really appreciate that you start with in, instead of talking down um is to allow them to lead and say what are you feeling and what do you want to share um, and do you feel safe do you trust me a lot when i guide people through the meditation i'm like where is that inner child do you need to kneel down to get to their level like, is there back to When I first connected with little Christine, um, when I was processing something just a few years ago, and I had I had suppressed a memory for like 30 years, and I went back to do the work on it. And when I went back, there was little Christine, and she's standing with her arms crossed, and her back was to me. And whenever I tried to walk to her, she just turned to, to like keep her back to me. And I was like, oh, she's mad. Okay. I'm right. mad. I'm going to just sit, sit down here. I'm going to wait. We're reestablishing trust at that point because likely as a consequence of that disconnection from the inner child, its needs, its emotions, its expression, and that we've ignored it and suppressed it uh, or oppressed it in whatever ways. And, and we've, we've been likely the, you know, one of the biggest uh, participants in that later in life where you're like, oh, wait, I'm the one oppressing my voice. I'm the one oppressing my feelings. And so it feels like with that self-abandonment dynamic happening, it, it can happen when you first go to the inner child. They don't trust you because you've left them. You know, they were left by parents or abandoned in any way. And so what I'm hearing, and I really appreciate this, is the need to establish trust and and be in the divine feminine around patient. This is an imposing will. This is um, slow and gentle and just allowing this very, very feminine energy that just says, I'm here. One of the statements that I love to reinforce in this, in that, in that very piece is your feelings matter and your voice matters. I'm here whenever, if I like this, you, you care to share. And then we get to back it up with not, okay, well, it's been three seconds. I'm out. Right, right. You know, like, come on already. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Nine o'clock. Yeah. So we really get to be patient because it's an aspect of ourself that is learning to trust us again. In that moment, the adult of us is actually reestablishing a connection and a relationship with an abandoned part of ourselves of the, this, this little, this little version of ourselves. Um, and in that, in that reestablishment of that relationship, it feels like then when the trust and the healing and the, and that, the, that relationship is gelled again, then we also get to have, it feels like that also unlocks this other part of the inner child, which is creative and adventurous and playful and passionate that when I hear in my clients that they have creative blocks or they're, you know, having a block with joy or happiness, 
uh, you know, creativity or passion or sensuality in their life. And I'm like, oh, they, they're, they're disconnected from this playful, creative part of themselves, which is likely some wound and self-abandonment um, in the way of that. 100%. And I, that, that patience and that waiting, I'm glad you highlighted that again, because inner child work, it can't be rushed. And oftentimes I'll see people because, you know, I'm one of them. We get so committed to our personal <laughs> development. We're like, oh my gosh, that's issue. I just need to solve it now. Like, I know this is because, you know, my dad shamed me when I was six years old and that's why X, Y, Z. So, okay, let me just go heal that six year old and I'll have what I want. Yeah. Then, like, then I'm on the abundance wheel. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's exactly the problem. The inner child has felt neglected because you've been chasing what you want. You've been chasing career or money or perfect body or love or whatever. And all the while the inner child's like, what about me? What about me? And so when we rush that process, it just reinforces that wounding of either I'm too much or not enough. You know, because that's that's so something that every human can be relate to. We feel too much in this, we were told we were too sensitive or too this or too that, or not enough this. We were either told it verbally or it was inferred with how we would treat it. And so that that patience and that process with first just establishing that trust and not wanting anything from the inner child because I see when I work with people, people want something from the inner child. And then it like reverses it where you want your inner child to heal you. And it's like, no, 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 <laughs> <laughs> wrong order. And especially for people who played parental roles with their parents, you know, yeah. when they do their inner child work, what can happen is then they want the inner child to take care of them and to reassure them. It's like, no, 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 you're there for the inner child. And you've got to be hold that patient, loving place and let that little one lead because otherwise more walls come up and it gets harder to get in there. And so uh, abs absolutely reestablishing that trust and listening genuinely, genuinely, authentically curious, authentically present. And so when that, when that, you know, shoulder starts to turn um, and the inner child starts coming forward and expressing, then there is the ability to create understanding about what the real issue is or what the feeling is or where the gap, so that they can begin to name in their own words the gap of, of their issue, their um, how they see it. It might not be rational for our adult self to understand how our inner child saw it because a four-year-old, a six-year-old, or an eight-year-old doesn't doesn't see the whole picture. They see what they see, and it's not about like you said. Well, that's because mom did this and dad didn't have this, and it, it's not about forcing them to see the bigger picture of things. As an adult, we can see the bigger perspective of things, sure. but we're not we're not in this moment looking at the adult's perspective. We're looking at where that perspective is trapped in a six-year-old mindset. Of, of 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 this experience and so in that place we get to have this conversation and and create understanding and and then and then when we have an understanding of oh it's this i understand now am i getting it right you feel this or you wanted this or your feelings were stuffed or um so-and-so said that that's not important even though it was super important to you in that moment and if we get to honor the feelings even though we might think well that's irrational or whatever it is absolutely rational it's absolutely just from that lens of the inner child it's to, to validate and honor the feelings um and so then what do we do in that in that process where would you take so somebody what it, it really depends it all depends on where the inner child is yeah. so a big thing that usually comes next once you establish trust and once you have a conversation so as children most of us really didn't get to express our feelings yeah. in, in a full way they got interrupted they we either were over soothed or we were shamed for them or we got in trouble for them so and in you know i think a lot of people miss that they may have been over soothed and think that mm -hmm. they they you know, their feelings were fine as a child. They had super loving, nurturing parents. But sometimes what can happen with parents is they get so uncomfortable with their child's emotion that they over -sue. They can't stand to see their child upset that they interrupt the natural release of the process. 
especially deep, deep sadness and rage. You know, I tell parents, like, let your children have their temper tantrums. You know, let them get it all out and just say, I'm here. I see you're angry. I'm here. I see you sad. I'm here. And that's what we do with the inner child. You know, what do you want to say? What are you feeling? And we hold the space for them to express their feelings. So when I'm doing inner child work, I make sure that I have a box of Kleenex nearby, a journal nearby, some crayons nearby and paper, and like a pillow and something to hit with. My favorite is a pool noodle. <laughs> You know, those foam pool noodles? It's awesome. Yeah, because I know for me, and this is so true for women, because anger is not something that we're provided an outlet for. Yeah. And, you know, part of the feminine is our fierceness. People think the feminine is just this flowy goddessy, and there's that, but there's also Kali. There's this like feminine, fierce, like warrior woman, you know, lioness in there. And for so many of us, that anger was repressed. So when we're doing that inner child work, we just want to have a, a, a playground, like all the tools there. So if that inner child needs to hit a pillow and scream, it gets to. If it needs to cry, it gets to. Oh, the other thing I have is a stuffed animal, so like gold and, oh, and rock. Yeah. Yeah. And the crayons are great because you can, with your non-dominant hand, write things or express things or just just let that those feelings come out. And again, the mind doesn't know the difference between well-imagined like thought and actual reality. So if you really give yourself permission and set the intention to allow that inner child to come up, you'll be amazed at what you can explore. And it's just about riding the wave. So it's not going in and being solution-based. You know, it's not going in and being like, I'm going to heal this inner child so I can have what I want. It's, it is time for this inner child to express. So yeah. from my perspective, we always start with the emotional layer. We always start there. Then we can move more to the mental in terms of beliefs and limiting beliefs and reframing them. Then we can move to some of the behavioral shifts that we want to make. Then we can move to the spiritual and the forgiveness and seeing the bigger picture. But from my perspective and my own work and 16 years of working with people, it's always the emotions where we begin. Agreed. 100%. I, I love the, the whole, I haven't done that before where, I set up like all of these options, like a little playroom. I love that idea. I hope that everybody um, takes advantage of this wonderful, um, ed, you know, solution to just have all of these things. And as kids, we knew what we wanted. If we wanted to take a nap, we did. If we wanted to ride a bike, we did. If we want to climb a tree. I'm done with that. I don't want to do that anymore. We were very much in the moment and made our own decisions. Um, and if we didn't like anything anymore, we didn't, we didn't do it anymore. And if, if, if somebody didn't want to play with us anymore, a game, we didn't take it personally. It's really amazing. Yeah. Uh, but I want to, I want to visit this piece around creating a safe container without expectations, yeah. like solution or timeline, a, a safe container that has lots of options in it and permission to express because i think that that's one of the things that as kids perhaps like you mentioned we were interrupted or our tantrum was inconvenient it was in a grocery store it was at a holiday dinner table and then we were shamed it and i want to address something here that you said that women you know, uh, have more of the fiery emotions of press that it's not okay for a little girl to scream or cry you know or or, or get angry and so a lot of the things that are oppressed within women ha ha have to do with rage, resentment, anger, and voice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the breath work that I do, and I know you do breath work too, in the breath work, it's giving a lot of times women permission to be angry and have a voice and it's okay to scream. It's okay to, my, my first breath work experience where I was receiving, the first thing that came out was rage because the container was held so clear and so safe. When I, when I gave permission without, without stuffing my feelings, without, mon, you know, filtering it or, or, or any of that, moderating it in any way. And I just, completely let myself be uninhibited with what I was feeling. Rage was the first emotion that came out. And I let her, I let the dragon lady biatch like roar. And it was like, I was hoarse for three days, Christine. Yeah. And, and, um, and just the little part of me that wasn't allowed to be angry got stuffed. And I think the flip is the case often 
and I know these are generalizations and, 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 you know, oftentimes not always 100% the case, but I think what is often common for men and boys don't feel, don't cry, don't be a wist, don't, don't emote. And so I think that in the, in the breath work and the healing work that I've experienced, it's giving permission for men to, to cry and that it's not a sign of weakness that their little wounded little boy has the right to cry. It's a natural human emotion when your doggy dies or you, you don't get a, you, you know, somebody doesn't like you back or you, you, you don't get to have a donut for breakfast like it's, or, or worse, you know, if yeah. you're bigger trauma. But I think that permission for men to have the watery emotions and not feel that that is a, 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 a problem with that, that, that they're not being a man that they're less of a man because of that. And have you, ex have you experienced any of that? Those, those two things with your healing work, what you've come across? Massively, both personally and in, in people I work with, you know, at all my women's retreat, I have an anger burn where it's like a two hour process of you know, a grief release first because women are more comfortable in their sadness. Watery. Yeah. Watery. Emotion. So we get the, we get the watery out and we get, <laughs> to get the heart open and they think they're not, <laughs> Yeah, and they think they're so tired and they're so drained and oh my gosh. And I'm like, oh no, you have no idea what you're capable of. That's day one. Yeah. <laughs> and, well um, so then we go into a massive, massive anger burn. And um, it's not just, and I think we have to be mindful of how we release emotion because, you know, I've been to some events where it's just kind of a cathartic release where they just pump you up and you just scream. And I guess that's good. It's a cathartic release. But if you're not at like riding your anger back and, and and knowing what it's about, then it's not, it's just kind of catharsis versus, versus an actual healing release. And so for me, a big part of anger work has been, you know, again, riding a feeling back in time. Like I'll give an example. So I had headaches, started getting headaches in fifth grade and I had them every day for 27 years. I took so much aspirin. It was in addition to being on antidepressants and all, all kinds of other stuff. And my headache started to go away when I learned anger work. And whenever I have a headache on a hot day, it is like, it's so annoying. But I, because the last thing you want to do when you have a headache is to go hit something and scream. Like that's the last thing I want to do. Right. However, that's my body's way of, and, and again, I think why I started getting headaches in fifth grade is because I had, I had so much anger. There was stuff going on that my parents didn't know about that I couldn't tell them. I was being teasers. I was being teased. There's just like a lot of stuff going on, but I, I, I was expected to be the good girl. Like my mom always called me her little angel. And so I felt I had to live into that. And so I just suppressed and repressed everything. And so, so much for me of coming off antidepressants, of not having headaches of dealing with a lot of health things, including thyroid has been anger work. I'm angry because I'm mad because I'm pissed off because and using my voice and going back to those memories and expressing and saying a lot of fuck yous, you know, to, to the people, not to them, but in my release. And what's incredible for me is the clearing that can happen after that. Yeah, I may be a little bit tired, but the next day it's like I'm in a good mood and the headache is clear and I'm more intuitive and I'm more that inner child, more playful and happy and like all of those things. And so, you know, I'm, I'm always amazed when people, I work with people that come to a retreat and I talk about anger. Oh, I'm not angry. I think I'm going to write a book called I'm Not Angry. <laughs> it parentheses, yes, you are. And that's okay. Right. Um, because when we don't deal with the anger, as men, it can turn into unhealthy aggression or passivity. We can get too much into our feminine as men. And as women, it gets, it turns into irritability. It leaks out in irritability, shortness, criticism, lack of passion, both in terms of our career, what we want to do, how we are in the world, and in terms of sex and sensuality. Like it just kind of turns all that off because we, we, we're not like fueling our fire. So it's, it's, and I'm not saying that people have to go around, you know, beating pillows and screaming all day. However, it is an important part, I believe, of the human experience is to have a healthy, because we all get built up, especially now in this especially time. Especially now. 
when there's so much going on, and even if you're feeling fine, just being the collective soup of the anger and the fear and the uncertainty that's happening right now, it's sort of impossible not to feel it. And so we need these releases because, and, and, and at the end of any anger release, so I'll, I'll release and I'll just ride the wave. And a lot of times after anger, one of two things will happen, either tears and I'll just need to have a good cry and walk myself or joy and fire. And I'll need to dance or move or shake it out or something. It'll go one of two directions. But I always make sure at the end, I move into a process of forgiveness. Forgive myself for judging myself as X, Y, Z. I forgive myself for buying into the misunderstanding. Like I let go and release. Like that to me is the, the final piece of it so that the, the unconscious in the body knows, all right, like I get the lesson. I'm, I'm not just processing for the sake of processing it. I'm processing and releasing this so that I can like elevate my consciousness and my, my heart and my love. And, you know, I think a lot of times one of my teachers, you know, Ariel Spilsbury, are you familiar with her? Not yet. Mm -hmm. Oh, she's amazing. She's amazing. Um, She is who I did like a lot of priestess training with and taught me a lot about the divine feminine. And she talks about how meditation, closed eye meditation is actually a very masculine Mm -hmm. form of meditation because it's very like shut out the world, go within and the more feminine form of meditation is that open eye, that soft gaze, that like diffuse awareness where you're sort of taking in and expanding into versus like closing in in darkness. The feminine is more like that light and that openness. And that's so much to me what like emotional expression is about. It's about not contracting and confining it, but just letting it be. Yeah. It's so valuable. I, I really appreciate that you're just talking about having an anger release practice, you know, especially now things are be, build, building up. And if you don't have a release, uh, spa- a safe space to release as an adult, frustration, overwhelm, anxiety, stress, then it builds, especially now it's just stacking, stacking, stacking. And what, I, what I've noticed, the correlation is when emotions are being stuffed then addictions go up and picking fights goes up, you know, whether it's with a partner, irritability goes up. And that, you know, especially around anger, the liver organ gets really hungry and alcohol consumption tends to go hand in hand with an excess of of stress, anger, resentment. And more of the fiery emotions, not having a healthy outlet. And I know that in my years where I was more of a of, of a drinker, it was sedating the fact that my lifestyle was really fiery and really intense, and there was a tremendous amount of anxiety and and anger that hadn't been released yet from young adulthood and childhood. And then you stack on top of that stressful lifestyle, and you know. Um, stress in the external world and it's a Molotov cocktail for for uh, drug addictions and alcohol addictions to go up and 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 witnessing the especially for young boys in in like you know middle school that you know pot is the is is the is the drug of choice because it's like hey I need something to soften this yeah testosterone stress i have to i have to compete i have to i have to have six bag abs i have to say the right thing i have to be smart i have to be successful i have to actually win at sports or like all of these pressures to have it all figured out and you know so uh, young boys i think in that place the addiction is i just need to calm everything down and i don't have any other safe place to do that and so that is more of a, a of a softer feeling like getting high and checking out yeah. Uh, is a little bit different than than alcohol and 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 I've noticed the correlations between when emotions are stuck in men and women and like women are like okay let me let me eat you know and some are addicted to working out in those places some are addicted to sex and so the, uh, everything that you're talking about is correlated to let me reach for something to either fill the void make me feel better or sedate these feelings. And so I deeply appreciate um, this reminder for all of us to have a safe space for whatever emotions are coming up 
that doesn't require your partner or friend or family member to process with you. But learning how to actually create your own playpen, your, you know, your own like inner child sacred space yeah. so that if you need to, and I've done that before with crayon, like a black crayon, just like, yeah. and then, or a pillow. I've done that before, but um, some of your other ideas are fantastic. And, you know, to just carve out time to just do that check-in. You might not think, like you said before, people say, oh, I'm not angry. And people say, oh, I'm not sad. It's like, okay, well, let's just check in and ask a couple questions and to see if that's actually true yeah. or if there's denial. And so many people that, that, that come here in, in my healing practice or retreats or whatever it is, as soon as a tear starts coming, I'm so sorry. They're, yeah. they're, they're immediately apologizing for this healthy expression of authentic emotion coming out known as a tear and i'm like oh oh holy water oh let it flow it's, yeah. it's you know, that's holy water yeah. and you know like that that's an example of where the inner child way back or or the child was told that there that there's something wrong with their emotions yeah. and that is one where i'm like okay that is not a rule that exists here Whatever emotion you've got, it's welcome. It's and so welcome. it's so welcome. Like tears, whether it's tears of sadness, tears of truth, or tears of joy, it's authentic information rising from like way down. And um, it's like, wow, that may, if it's a healing tear from a trauma or a sadness or a grief, like we grieve, we have losses, there's breakups, there's disappointments. Um, there's deaths, uh, there's yeah. chapters that end and yeah. grief yeah. is like healthy emotion that if it's a tear, then it's shameful for men and even for women. And so many people apologize. I for see the same tears. thing. I'm so glad oh, you said that. I'm put it on your body. I'm like, oh, that tear, let it, let it cleanse out things or or, or allow myself to express. These go hand in hand where the, the emotions are stuffed and then so is the voice. And you're, you're bringing up so many wonderful solutions, especially now as, as we stack stress on top of unresolved issues. The shadow is, is just rising in a fierce way um, to be looked at. And this kind of work is so valuable to go in and, and learn how, because I don't think most of us know how to do this because as, you know, as children, we, we didn't have a safe space to process our emotions. And so this is the reparenting part of, okay, you can create a safe space yes. to, to honor what you're feeling and also not allow the six year, six year old to make adult decisions. Like the six year old should not be in charge of the budget or you know what 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 you eat each day like we with that you know he or she does not have the emotional maturity <laughs> to make great choices there but if it's not healed then sometimes we have that that stunted version of ourselves making decisions in adult places that is not always bringing about the best <laughs> you know scenarios in our welcome to my dating life <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> right yeah, it was the wounded you know 13 to 16 year old who never felt like the boys who liked her liked her back. Mm. So I kept playing that out over and over again because she kept picking them. Yeah. And it um, wasn't until I went in and, and spoke with her and did the work with her and um, that, that the men that I was attracted to and that I attracted started to shift. Yeah. And you're right. Like a lot of times we're unconsciously driven by that six year old or 10 year old or 14 year old. Most of our, behaviors and actions and choices that we want to change are unmet needs, driven by unmet needs from that little one. And sometimes, you know, when I'm really connected with that little one and I just need like one of those days, I'll ask little eight-year-old Christine, like, what do you want for dinner? Like, it's your choice tonight. And, you know, usually it's coconut ice cream. <laughs> um, but I'm very conscious of that. And it's like, okay, like tonight, we get to do that. Just like you, just like parents do. Like sometimes a kid just gets to stay up late. Not every night, but some night. But when you're, when you have that relationship, you can make decisions for the inner child and with the inner child. 
Yeah. And, and as long as that inner child feels held and safe and seen and like they matter, they're not going to be acting out in right. ways that end up sabotaging, but really protecting you. They're on board, but they're not, you know, in the driver's seat running all of the adult decisions. But when it's when it's appropriate to really say, hey, let's play today. How do you want to play? Or here's our creative time. How do you want to create and and give them the authority in the spaces that make sense to really um, to have a voice and, a, and space. And I think that that I, you make a good point of, of, of consulting and bringing the inner child on board because so so much of the adulting is well uh i don't dance i don't play that that's stupid i don't i don't do arts and crafts or like that that kind of thing that is shaming playfulness right in, in the adult in the adult uh, arena that says i'm too old for that and that is another way of oppressing the inner child but it's like but joy is a natural part of the human experience and this is a part of our our life being full spectrum is being able to laugh hysterically and play and look silly and have fun and create in a way that isn't being well is it for an a and is it for a, a is there a responsible outcome to this is it functional and uh, like just just valuing playtime and, and creative expression and, and the, the healthy version of that. And that's where the inner child we, we want on board, um, just not leading all of the decisions. Right. So um, how, how, do we, how do we navigate this when there has been a physical or sexual uh, a boundary yeah. crossed, when, when it's moved into past the I'm not good enough or mommy's not seeing me or dad's emotionally unavailable and those unmet needs. How, how does that translate when we actually have a physical yeah. trauma or a sexual, um, you know, where there, where it was non-consensual and our body, our body was involved. Yeah. Such a good question. It's so important to talk about because it's so common. You know, it's really so common. so common and i think a lot of Seven people men, yeah. like that think you know no it's just how my parents punish me you really shouldn't have gotten spanked for not putting away your shoes um so there's a couple things i want to say about that um first just so much compassion for anyone who's experienced that was um i have so much compassion for just all human beings because it can be a rough ride this human thing uh, but i connect to that physical especially sexual abuse and for me and for so many of the people that I've worked with, it's everything that we've talked about. It's going back and having that safe space. And it often requires some work with the body. So that can be, and this is where practitioners are really useful. I think when there's a lot of trauma, especially physical or sexual trauma, we need help. We need yeah. like another being there yeah. helping us navigate because it can feel real, real scary to go back to those places. Yeah. So somatic practitioners that really help you get in the body and release the feeling, body workers that have awareness of trauma, that are trauma-informed and can go into the body and in, in a gentle and urine-control way, put hands in places and help you release it from your body. Because I know for me, I've, it had, I needed that physical release. Like I did a lot emotionally and a lot going back and talking to that inner child but the somatic body-based work and then the trauma-informed body work yeah. was really, really an important piece because I think when it hits us on the physical or sexual level, it, it becomes denser. You know, it hits that physical plane. And so we often need to work with the physical plane to free ourselves of that. And so for anyone listening, I would just encourage you, you know, I've always been amazed at how when I get to a point where a new memory comes up or I'm ready to deal with something that maybe I've kind of like not been ready to look at the right healer emerges. Like I'm I, over here in a conversation or I'm introduced or I'm in a circle or something happens where it will show up. And I'm like, Oh, that, like yeah. that, that. And again, we're not looking to someone to go and heal us because we are our own healers and we're not in the world independently. We're here together. And 
it's very, very, I think, supportive to ourself and our inner child to go like, we're going to get somebody to help us with this. Because yeah. often the inner child felt like he or she didn't have allies. He or she didn't have safe people that they could express with. So a big part of healing the inner child is going and finding the safe people, going and finding your allies, going and finding not just your tribe in terms of soul family and friends, but your healers, your team. Yeah. I call my team Christine. You know, they're they're on my team and they're my allies and they help they help me get to the places inside that I can't get to on my own. Just yeah. like a, a relationship can be deeply healing for the places we can't get to on our own. Often it is these these healers and practitioners that help us get to those places. So that's what I recommend if you have that. Really valuable, really valuable. And I think that you're absolutely spot on with somebody in the 3D that help help us can re reinform just safe touch yeah. and also to be held in ways in which our child wasn't held safely and respectfully without an agenda, without, you know, without rushing and really present and, and and in that listening space uh, also here it feels like in that in the trauma that what I have found personally and also in my clients in in and where I in the training that I received is is this addition to reestablishing this is my space yeah. And of course, we want to do that as a, as a child, where we where we we were receiving information or emotion or trauma outside of ourselves. You know, we want to be less permeable than we were as a child. But in this case, it's not just thoughts or beliefs or emotion or opinions or things that we saw. But when that that very permeable, like no boundary as a child, because we just want to be around people we we don't really have those edges and those wait this is mine we don't have that awareness and if a parent or a guardian or, or a sibling also is not informed and respectful or aware of boundaries then you know it, it, it is ideally their responsibility to honor our boundaries but if they don't have their own then they certainly don't understand our own so i've noticed in this journey in addition to what you're saying there around like somatic work to reinform I'm safe in my body. And I feel like a lot of those deeper traumas in, in order to have survived that a lifting out of the body and a disassociation with the body has been the survival mechanism. So ungrounding and not really fully connected to the body has been a way to navigate until it's safe. And we learn how to come down and re inhabit the body again. And without an understanding and a reestablishment of, oh, this is my space. I'm not somebody's punching bag. I'm not somebody's dumping ground. I am not somebody's sexual playground. This is my space. And it's, it doesn't mean I don't love and care about other people, but it's okay for me. And like that permission and the authority to say, it's okay for me to hold a boundary here. That doesn't mean I'm selfish. That doesn't mean I'm um, uncaring. And I feel like there's deeper like realignments with, with sexual and physical abuse, trauma, uh, healing that invites that reestablishment of this is my space. And I noticed that later in adult relationships, there's there's codependencies and physical abuses and, and all over the place, leaking energies, because that has still not been reestablished as an adult. Oh, this is my space. Yeah. Yeah. So how, I mean, does that land at all? Or how, how oh, do you absolutely. navigate that with people? Absolutely. So, I mean, I see that. So, and I saw it in myself, there's a dissociation from the body. Yes, yes. You know, it's interesting. Sexual abuse can go one of two ways, either very promiscuous because there's a dissociation yes. and it's like, well, it's kind of, it's, you know, it, 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 it's, it's so do. confusing, especially molestation because it, it can, like, it's confusing for the body because it can feel good, but yet you know it's wrong. So it's very, very, very confusing for children on so many levels. So yeah, it goes to either shut down, which is more the direction I went, or, or promiscuity because there's that lack of connection to the body. Um, but that's I think that's a big part for every human, like you know, such a big coping strategy. I see it in kind of one of two ways: either people leave the body, 
or they hunker down and they just endure and they become like doormats and they just get really, really heavy with, yeah. with it. And to gain, gain weight as a protection device. Yeah. And so this is a journey for anybody listening or watching. And I think that, that uh, so much there's a secondary wounding when there has been a trauma or, a, a, you know, an un unwanted experience uh, that, that on top of that, if they tried to express right. and were shut down or shamed or it wasn't safe, that, that there's a secondary wounding of not only did my body not matter, but, um, my voice doesn't matter and I'm not supposed to talk about it, which which then goes to thyroid problems and other problems. And later in life, it's not OK for me to express my feelings or ever say no or have a boundary, um, which leads to a lot of like unhealthy taking on everybody's stuff and feeling like this is this is life. This is this is this is my purpose in life to be everybody's trash can. And so um I appreciate what you're saying about that. The, the, the you know the reattunement there is super valuable, and you know permission to claim your body again and permission oh. to like set a boundary and say no. Especially like with we, you, you know girls, it's not you're not supposed to be angry, but you're also not supposed to say no. You, you know you're right. supposed to be the accommodator, and this is back to adulting again. Yeah. You know back to reparenting and saying this is okay for me to do this and I can do that in a way that isn't a bitch or a doormat. And, and whether it's somebody, you know, wanting something from you like at overtime at work or, or, you know, things to pro progress sexually or yeah. they're you know, wanting you to, you know, do this favor for them is like, it's okay to have this self check-in yeah. to be like, does this feel right for me? Right. And is this, for me? Is this in my highest good is this? Yeah. yeah, it's so it's so it's it's one of those things, too, that I just encourage people to remember that no is a complete sentence. And so many of us follow <laughs> no with this massive justification or apology. And it, and no, you can actually just say no. Yeah. No. And, and what I've learned about boundaries is just like I can't wait till I feel ready to make big moves in my life. I can't wait until other people are okay with my boundaries to set them. That was my biggest learning to boundaries is yes. in setting boundaries, people are going to be upset because I'm changing the rules. I'm changing the, the, the dynamic. And but I have to be okay with that because I have to let my own, like my own feelings and my own heart. And I have to be more of an ally to myself. I've had more loyalty to myself. I care more about my own feelings than others. Boundaries doesn't mean you're a jerk. It doesn't mean that you're not loving. It doesn't mean that you have a permission slip to just be selfish. It's about self-honoring. And I think a lot of people, especially people pleasers, Woo. use self-honoring choices with selfish choices. Yeah. Um, selfish choices are very, very different than self-honoring choices. Self-honoring choices come from truth and love and are protecting that inner child. And they're meeting our needs. And sometimes other people don't like them. But that doesn't mean that they're wrong. Doesn't mean right. And this is a this is a whole other skill that happens when when you're connecting with that inner child, they're going to have needs and those needs are going to conflict with other people's needs in your life. There's going to be conflict at times where it's like I need sleep or I need space and somebody else's demand on your time, your energy or your emotion okay. may be in a direct conflict with that need. And so part of this inner child healing and, and reparenting process will be learning a whole new skill of advocating for self in a healthy, conscious way to express your needs. And this whole other thing, which I think is a whole other skill set that I'm you know, still refining is really deeply being okay with when somebody throws a tantrum, I'm, I'm okay when they're expressing that they don't like the need that I've placed or, or uh, a boundary or a no that, you know, really learning how to honor that and not allow them to push that, that boundary over because you're just teaching them that your boundary is permeable. It's really not real. It's just, it, it, it's, it's not firm. Right. And it, it tests that. And I find that over and over again, when you place a boundary, all somebody has to do is ask three times and it pushes over or all they, they have to get louder or they throw the guilt hook and then there goes the boundary. Goes. So it feels like this whole other skill that will happening in the reparenting and 
you know, honoring the inner child to be able to express um, and advocate for ourselves in a way. And that's a whole, that's a whole other thing. Thing, yeah. Right. That we were kind of new at. We're kind of new at. And so um, this is juicy and delicious just to be able to express, feel that it's OK for me to be me. It's OK for me to feel. It's OK for me to say, no, I love that. No is a complete sentence. Mm -hmm. I love that. And then, you know, when we're in that place of self honoring, then we're less inclined to be in codependent relationships with people. Right needing their validation or needing any of that. Um, anything else you want to share before we wrap about, you know, tools or steps that people can take on this journey of reparenting themselves? Yeah, I would just say, you know, if you feel like you don't have a connection to the inner child, just get some pictures of yourself when you were little or draw some pictures and just, just start to set the intention. With it's it's in there, but my favorite way to connect is just to look at a picture of me when I was little. Mm -hmm. And you know, we teach an inner child workshop. It's a virtual workshop, so people can come if they really feel like this is like want to dive into it more. But it, it, it's the most important, I think, personal development work we do because when we skip over that part, we just keep running into the same obstacles over and over and over again because unmet needs and unresolved wounding perpetuate current obstacles that's just in simplest terms that's just the way it works which, is, which means we can be putting ourselves no matter what we're experiencing right now and i'm sure we're all experiencing a lot that it puts us back in the power position in our lives and not you know the victim place that this is all happening to me and it gives us the opportunity to say if this pattern keeps repeating it's happening for me to get my attention to look at the core cause of it and you've given us some wonderful tools today i so appreciate your wisdom and your depth of knowledge and experience and authenticity vulnerability and your breadth of of experience and wisdom in this in this arena okay. you're certainly just um you know, we're, we're so blessed to have you in the community. Just truth telling and idea sharing from a vulnerable, honest place. It's really precious and valuable. Mm, my pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs> Where can people find you and this inner child workshop? Because it sounds amazing. Oh, yeah. And, uh, so tell everybody where they can find you, honey. So the inner child workshop is christinehasser.com slash inner child. And everything's there at christinehasler.com. When you sign up for my list, you get a coaching assessment. You get to go through a little coaching practice. And then um, the podcast over at Nile of It, where you can hear those coaching, coaching slash spiritual psychology calls. And then my favorite social media platform is Instagram. I'm just Christine Hassler there. Fantastic. Wonderful, wonderful. We'll be sure to have all of that in the notes and then also a free gift for, a, you know, a guided like inner child just journey to connect with that mm -hmm. part of ourselves with the, the feelings and the truth and, you know, the, the emotions that are there with inner child. So go grab that free gift as well. As always, you can find Ana Hot Stuff, uh, uh, Ana Hot to here at shamanjellichealing.com and everything is there. And also Instagram is my platform of choice, Ana Hot to Ananda. And if you really enjoyed this conversation with Christine, please share it. If you think there's somebody that is struggling with inner child issues or would, would benefit from these tools that we've shared today and these beautiful insights, please share it with somebody else. And let us know what you thought about this conversation. If you enjoyed it, please leave a rave review on the podcast. And looking forward to those sisters that are called to go in doing the sacred feminine work, uh, you know, all the way from conception to now clearing out the weeds that have been in the garden that are blocking our most radiant self. And we're just coming back to this journey of remembering who we are at a purest level, this beautiful flower in the garden and just dissolving all of the weeds in, in the way, the distortions and the oppression or limitations and uh, freeing the flower within. So that um, we will also have in the show notes. So thank you so much, Christine. You are a dear, a blessing, and you are an angel. Your mom was right. And, uh, <laughs> and as an angel that, that has a full range of uh, healthy emotions. <laughs> thank you so much. 
always grateful and looking forward to playing um, soon in 3D. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Blessings, everybody. Go forth and shine. Hope you enjoyed this.